you know what it really means to be brave? I can tell you, it takes heart and a people who after failing once, twice, many times, to stop, get up and try again. It takes a leader who says, we will rise from the ashes and try again. Who put his people, their freedom and the country's democracy first? What does it mean to be brave? It means being open to opportunities and overcoming the fear of exposure. It's brave to focus on more than just the tangible. Bravery, it's not about shouting loudly and making bold moves. It's about continuity. To prove time and again that we have what it takes, that we're a force to be reckoned with. But it's not enough to only acknowledge our faults. We have to be brave enough to intentionally address them. This is the year in which we will turn the tide on corruption. Because it takes bravery to keep going, to keep growing. It takes bravery to take a stand in the midst of a revolution. To take a leap of faith in a climate of opportunity and stand at the ready for what the future might bring. To welcome those who push the boundaries and being open to the unknown because it takes bravery to realize potential. What I'm trying to say is that it's bravery that makes all the difference. Invest in South Africa, the brave future. Mr. Okeke. We have a special guest, uh, DG Naweni, 
who is the principal of the National School of Government in South Africa, as a speaker today. Ms. Janine Hills is the founder and CEO of Janine Hills Authentic Leadership. We also have Mr. Ashraf Gada, who is the founding champion of Champion South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, it was Nelson Mandela who said, a real leader uses every issue, no matter how serious and sensitive, to ensure that at the end of the debate, we should emerge stronger and more unified than ever. This will be the ethos of our conversation today, and we welcome you to participate. You are welcome, whether you are joining us on Zoom, whether you are joining us on YouTube, and whether you are joining us on Facebook. We have a team that is ready to take your questions and, your, and to capture your comments, so feel free to make an input so that we can emerge stronger together. We will now hand over to the Director General of the Government Communication and Information System, Ms. Pumla Williams. Ms. Williams is also the spokesperson for the Cabinet of South Africa. She holds a Master's in Public Administration from the University of South Africa. Her additional qualifications include a Certificate in Public Sector Finance from the University of Stellenbosch. She has years of experience in both provincial and national government, as well as various local and international NGOs, which have provided her with an extensive experience in governance issues and public service. Wouldn't you like to explore a country where two worlds intersect, where first world infrastructure meets an emerging market? where science and technology enjoy rapid advancement, a land where innovation creates a dynamic environment for growth, where a market of almost 60 million people provide you with the perfect springboard to access a continent of 1.3 billion people. Welcome to the future. Invest in South Africa. Wouldn't you like to explore a country where two worlds intersect, where first world infrastructure meets an emerging market, where diversity is celebrated through its people and its sectors. Where one of the most powerful economies in Africa embraces new opportunities. Where science and technology enjoy rapid advancement. A land where innovation creates a dynamic environment for growth. The world's leader in mining and minerals, with nearly 90% of all the platinum metals on Earth, and around 41% of all the world's gold. Home to 11 Nobel Peace Prize winners. And with the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Africa. It is one of only two countries in the world to have hosted three different World Cups, where a market of almost 60 million people provide you with the perfect springboard to access a continent of 1.3 billion people. It's where the impossible is made possible. Welcome to South Africa, a land of endless possibilities. A truly inspiring country. Welcome to the future. Invest in South Africa. Powered by Brand South Africa. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We will start by having remarks by our partner, uh, the African Leadership Limited United Kingdom. And then in the course of the program, we will be addressed accordingly by the DG of GCIS, the managing editor of African Leadership, Mr. Kingslow KK, is a media practitioner and a specialist with experience in print journalism, management, and edit editorial functions. He has consistently led African leadership's international outreaches in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East and the Americas. He has interviewed African business leaders, political and diplomatic leaders. Over to you, Mr. Okeke, uh, for your address as a strategic partner in this venture. Thank you very much, Pumela. 
and uh, greetings to everyone, uh, distinguished guests and the attendees. Uh, it's it's a great um, honor to be part of today's conversation uh, because uh, at a time like this in the, the continent, as we're faced with a lot of challenges uh, occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as also, um, of course, uh, economic-induced um, hardships that we're facing across the continent, there is no better time as this for us to engender a conversation that tries to look at um, the issues as it were and uh, the challenges that leadership is facing and we must pause and ponder and ask ourselves a very important question. What will the great Madiba, Nelson Mandela, do at such a time like this? And uh, one of the major things uh, we've come to know as students of the great Madiba is that he is one that is a merchant in hope. As uh, succinctly captured by uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, a leader is a dealer in hope. And at a time like this, uh, there is no better thing to do than to, of course, promote and, uh, and, and engender hope. We know that as a continent, we are faced with a lot of challenges, a lot of e leadership issues, crisis here and there. But there is no better time to assure our people that these challenges would only serve as a springboard uh, for towards the future that we crave and truly desire. And for us at African Leadership, this has been our lifelong passion. Over the past 13 years, we've been committed to promoting, of course, um, leadership, purposeful leadership, and assuring all those that we come across that Africa, we have a resurgent Africa. We are, uh, you know, simply put, retelling the African story. Away from the tried headline of hunger, war, and famine, we are telling the world that Africa is the next, of course, current, not even next, a destination that if you're not in Africa, of course, you are nowhere. Um, it ties in very, you know, nicely with, of course, um, the great Madiba's position, as it were, that at a time like this, what would we do? We Would we sit back and look at the challenges that we're faced with? Would we sit back and begin to count our losses? Or would we dust, dust, dust ourselves up and look at the future that, that beckons, that is calling? And that, of course, it's, it's, what, it's what we've been about. Through our events and programs, we've been committed to showcasing the best of Africa. We have been committed to looking at the best in people, in leaders, as it were, because we know that leadership would make all the difference, as it were. When the push comes to shove, it is leadership. The ball stops at the leader's table. But at the end of the day, we understand that inherent in every leader, no matter how you see him or her, is the, is the desire to do good. But the vicissitudes of life sometimes distract them or hinder them from doing what, as it were, is necessary for the upliftment of humanity. But we also see that by bringing them together, celebrating them and encouraging them, we have engendered peer review. And this peer review is to say that if A can do it, then B can also do it. We're not looking at, we're not ignorant of the fact that these challenges, we have a lot of challenges in the continent, but we're also of the view that amidst these challenges, there are opportunities that we must look inwards and tap into draw from to be able to move to where we desire as a people. I dare say also that the founder of the African Leadership Magazine, Dr. Ken Giami, is a huge student, of course, uh, a diehard student of, 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 of Nelson Mandela. If that, if, if that had not been the case, he wouldn't have been, you know, drawn into this life of purposeful leadership, promoting purposeful leadership. We've celebrated leaders across various platforms, and our message has been simple. The people are looking up to you to do what is right. They have invested hope and trust in you because they believe that uh, uh, you hold, of course, the ace to make the difference in their lives. What would you do with this opportunity? And because we've seen that the great Madiba, time and again, even when he was faced with a lot of challenges, he had looked at his last opportunities. He has also seen that rather than go against his adversaries, he was committed to saying, look, rather than preach hate, we must preach love. And as a time like this, as a people and as a, con as a continent, we must look back and look at some of the principles, leadership principles that we've been taught. It has been loaded in books. It's been loaded in, of course, a lot of conversations, seminars and symposiums that he was part of during his lifetime. In this time of, in this time of crisis, we must go back and begin to consult these books and begin to consult some of the things that he has lived for. And it will be a great disservice to our generation yet unborn that he bequeathed a continent or a country 
that was that that he he believed should be led by love and to look back and see that the people who he has put in trust to hold forth until we meet again beyond that they are not running the race as it should be so i encourage us all business leaders political leaders whoever we may be we are our stakeholders in the africa project and the only way that we can make a difference is to ponder pause and say look we have come this far we have made these mistakes but here of course we have decided to stop and reflect and see what it is that we have got, gotten wrong and how do we move from here i guess that when we do that or i know that when we do that so much will change for us as a people a continent of over a billion, of course of of of, of averaging over a billion people we are a hungry we are a market that is hungry for product let that be the reflection and let let's 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 look inward and see how we can promote trade how we can promote conversations around job creation and infrastructure in fact the covid-19 pandemic research has shown that has 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 has, has you know pushed us it has pushed further constraints on our infrastructure especially health wise and of course you know that economies who were doing very well before because of the, the, the issue as it were, as it relates to uh, the finances of these economies, a lot has been, you know, there, there's a lot of issues around the economies now. So what we must do at this time is to look at how we can build back better. It's, it's it, the, 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 the wonderful thing about the pandemic is that even though it is such a huge loss for a lot of companies, economies uh, globally, it has also presented a fresh start for countries and continents like Africa, like, like, like Africa. So it means that if we have a clean slate to start, we must ask ourselves that difficult question and find answers. Where do we begin? We have a dead need for infrastructural development. We have a dead need, of course, for job creation. Would we sit back and look at our differences? Would we sit back and look at what divides us? or would sit back and look at what unites us and how we can build back better. I think as we go forward in this conversation, these are some of the questions we must answer as we look at all the issues and also look at authentic leadership, servant leadership, as well as champion leadership. These should be reflective of what and the challenges we face today and how we can advance from some of the issues we have. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you and I welcome you to this conversation as I hand over to my colleague, will fight to take us to the next stage of the of this event thank you and god bless us all thank you very much uh, mr kingsley or kk uh, we are now going to be addressed by the dg of gcis who is also the cabinet spokesperson for the republic of south africa that is DG Ms. Pumla Williams. Thereafter, we will hand over then to Wofai, who will moderate the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Program Director, distinguished panelists, a warm greetings to you all. It is a great honor and a pleasure to participate in this important panel discussion on tapping into former President Nelson Mandela's leadership principles in the times of crisis. This event takes place as part of commemorating the birth of Datumatiba. Program Director, we meet at a time when South Africa and the world continue to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Since its arrival last year, we have learned so much about it and are emulating Matiba's spirit of resilience whilst dealing with it. We have moved from knowing very little about protecting ourselves from this dreaded virus to where we are today. Our medical experts have worked tirelessly to support government in putting measures to protect the nation. South Africans have heeded government's message to use non-pharmaceutical health interventions to protect themselves whilst awaiting a cure or a vaccine. According to researchers, over 90% of South Africans have heeded the call to prevent the potential surge in infections 
by wearing masks in public places, regularly washing their hands with soap and water, or using 70% alcohol-based hand sanitizer, maintaining safe social distances, and generally avoiding crowded gatherings. Today we are proud to report that our vaccination program is gaining momentum with over 6 million people vaccinated to date. This number is expected to increase significantly following the decision to open more vaccination sites and allow for the walk-ins across the country. In the past weeks, South Africa experienced unprecedented violent riots which claimed several lives, damaged infrastructure, and adversely impacted our economy. Although calm and stable, stability have returned. The irony of the riots is that they happened during a month when we were supposed to join the rest of the world in commemorating the birth and celebrating the legacy of that Madiba. However, we have since bounced back as a nation that is united in our diversity to rebuild our beloved country. Program Director, Madiba was one of the struggle stalwarts who made immense personal sacrifices to ensure that South Africa becomes a non-racial, non-sexist, and united and prosperous society founded on the principles of justice, equality, and respect for human rights. His political activism saw him joining mass defiance and civil disobedience campaigns against the then apartheid regime. He also traveled widely across the country and to other African countries and also to the United Kingdom to organize resistance against the apartheid government and secure support for the struggle for freedom. In 1962, he was arrested and sentenced to five years for leaving the country illegally and in 1964, he was convicted of treason and sentenced to life in prison. His unwavering commitment to freedom and justice was demonstrated when he refused an offer for his conditional release after spending 22 years of incarceration. Madiba's resilience and perseverance are reflected in the fact that he spent 27 years in jail and did not compromise on his ideals of a democratic, non-racial, and non-sexist society. His release on the 11th of February 1990 brought a sense of hope that democracy would finally be realized in our nation. It was truly a turning point for our country as his release coincided with the unbanning of political parties, the return of those who were in exile, and the release of political prisoners. Our first democratic elections in, in April 1994 ushered in an era of building a democratic South Africa. President Mandela led with distinction despite the very difficult and delicate period in the history of our country. He was great, he was a great reconciliator and capable of calming the nation in perilous situations. Many will recall how Madiba strategically stepped in to address and pacify the nation after the assassination of South African Communist Party leader Chris Hani in April 1993. When South Africa was on the brink of political violence, in his address, I quote him, we must not let the men who worship war and who lust after blood precipitate action that will plunge our country into another Angola." Unquote. Program Director, former President Mandela was an 
exceptional servant leader. He walked out of prison after 27 years with no bitterness except the desire to drive the political ideals that he went to prison for. Tatuma Diba was a visionary, as reflected in his Rivonia trial speech from the dock in 1964, which I would like to quote, I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and a free society in which all persons live together in harmony with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if need be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die." Unquote. That Madiba did his part as a leader. As we celebrate his life and legacy, we all need to recommit ourselves to what he stood for and what he fought for. As a public servant that is entrusted with creating the better society for all, I should ex execute my responsibilities with integrity and honesty to contribute towards a better South Africa. As members of society, we need to commit in building the societies we envisaged in our constitution. To emulate the legacy of Nelson Mandela, we need to work together to build our economy so as to narrow the gap of inequalities, poverty, and unemployment in our society. As we continue to win the fight against the COVID-19, we commend the South Africans who came out in their numbers to condemn and prevent the destruction and looting witnessed in the past two weeks. Many people are voluntarily participating in cleaning up campaigns which makes us proud as South Africans. Those who wanted to destroy the legacy of Tatma Diba and other struggle stalwarts did not succeed. Those who seek to divide the nation that Madiba had and other struggle stalwarts sacrificed their lives for to unite will fail dismally. South Africans will continue to work for a united, non-racial, and non-sexist society. Each time we stumble, we will rise and rise again. I thank you. Many thanks to the DG of GCIS, a speech very well put together, timely and apt for the people of South Africa and Africa. Indeed, let's grow Africa and South Africa together. Thank you very much once again, the DG GCIS. My name is Wafai Samuel. I'm the Director of Communication and External Relations for the UK Liberia Chamber of Commerce in London, and I am pleased to lead on the second phase of this virtual conference. Like Mr. Kingsley Okeke and Madam Pumela had mentioned in the beginning of this conversation, leadership is very critical, very key to the advancement of Africa, whether you're talking about economic advancement, financial advancement or social advancement. Now the question is, over time, for so many decades, we've had different leaders in various capacities ad administering the resources and of course, the jobs for Africa. But now the question is, why have we had similar or almost the same results over time? That's a very critical question. Cultivation of leaders who have exemplary skills, who have exceptional character, is very key to the advancement of this continent. Another question is, what did the late Mandiba stand for? Why was he a global icon? There are rules, there are regulations, there are lessons to be learned from how he led the people of South Africa and how he led the people of Africa. For the rest of this virtual conference, we'll be talking with our very highly esteemed speakers who would be speaking to us about the principles that we should, adhe we should adhere to rather if we are to become very good leaders for the continent of Africa and if we are to advance our course for the continent of Africa. Very quickly, I'd like to say a very big thanks to Brand South Africa, responsible for a compelling and positive image of South Africa globally and of course country. And I'd also like to say a big thanks to African Leadership Magazine 
who are responsible for heralding the new generation of African leaders and, of course, the emergence of African leaders to the world. Once again, I welcome you all to this virtual conference as we kickstart with the next sessions, which would be taken by the speakers. I'd like to introduce the very first speaker who would be talking about authentic leadership. Should we speak in on authentic, on authentic leadership? And I have the pleasure of inviting someone who has been the founder and CEO of Chaining Hills Authentic Leadership as well as the, the founder and joint CEO of Ignite Africa. She's the past head of group communications for First National Bank, FNB, and a founding member of the team that built First Rand's eBox. Janine's integrity in business relationships is the foundation upon which she launched Vuma Reputation Management in 2005. Janine grew Vuma Reputation Management into an African company with global potentials. Janine's integrity in business relationships is the foundation upon which she launched a reputation management company in 2005, which was turned into a fully transformed black empowered company and sold out in 2020. After which she embarked on a new journey with Janine Hill's authentic leadership. Janine has delivered world class advisory service to at least 50 JSE listed companies. In addition, she has operated within at least 10 African countries and advised many multinational companies. She has also provided her services as a facilitator for the United Nations. Most recently, the very beautiful Janine contributed to a chapter on effective crisis communication for the recently published ebook, Managing Organizations During the COVID-19 Vortex. Her board, and director, her board and directorship positions rather includes Brand South Africa from 2016 to 2019, International Women's Forum South Africa from 2016 to March 2020, and of course, International Brand Reputation Community, amongst others. Very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished speakers, I am more than honored and delighted to introduce our very first speaker who would be taking us through authentic leadership modeling Nelson Mandela's principles in times of crisis. I welcome Ms. Janine Hales. Thank you very much. Oh, isn't this amazing? This webinar and this whole online business that we can be speaking from Liberia to South Africa to Nigeria to London. I mean, what an incredible audience. Thank you and everybody for dialing in today. Thank you so much. Um, and really, thank you to Brand South Africa and, of course, to the African Leadership Magazine. Really, thank you so much. What a fantastic organization. And the professionalism has been phenomenal. Um, technology is not always easy to spread around Africa and right throughout the world, but it's been fantastic. So, th really, thank you to the leaders today for making this all come together. And, of course, the two DGs that, are, that we've had the privilege of joining us today. And really about authentic leadership. This is about you. This is about you and the role that you play in society. And I think we have got, we are all so incredibly blessed to have had a leader like Madiba that has guided us. You know, um, some people say, oh, but it's old. You know, still to this day, I live by the leadership of what Madiba taught me. And, and really, as a leader, um, all I can say is we're not perfect. We're not expected to be perfect. Madiba was not perfect. He was certainly an authentic man that led, led by principles. And just really, I wanted to give some really good takeouts from an authentic leadership. What is an authentic leader? Because kind of what, what is this thing that we talk about? And maybe this will, will guide us all. And that is about being somebody with integrity, someone that's honest, reliable, consistent. Can you hear the, the same kind of trustworthy words keep coming through? And the key thing is, key thing is reliability. And, you know, if you're consistent, you don't have to be completely high. You don't have to be completely low. You have to be the middle of the ray. But you, the big thing is be consistent. We're going to make mistakes as leaders. But each and every one of us are leaders. Whether you are heading up a a local fraternity in a church group, whether you are in heading up in a mosque environment, whether you are leading a school group, whether you are leading, you know, a, a large corporate, whether you're leading a country for that matter, um, whether you're leading a department, a government department, you are a leader. 
And so you're not just an employee here. You're not just a cashier in, you know, in a pick and pay or a shop right checkers or whatever it might be. You are a leader because we need leadership right now. And those principles of honesty, integrity is what we will all need to guide our countries and guide Africa in moving forward. We really have the time now. As our previous speaker said, you know, KK, thank you for reminding everybody. Now is our time. I know we always talk about Africa's time, but really, if we think about it, right now we've got so much. We are so rich in value. Our people are the most incredible people. We've got what it takes to really position ourselves. And this is our time that we need to do our scenario planning, our preparation. The biggest thing I find that we don't do enough of is in Africa, and that is our forward planning. We need to be able to communicate better within ourselves. We need to build up trust amongst each other more. So how do we do that? Well, the only way we're going to do that is by communicating, engaging more. And we do that very well through Ubuntu, but we, we've lost that. A lot of the, the trust has been dropped. We've got a huge deficit of trust. But I must say what I saw in the last couple of weeks within South Africa particularly was how we came together as government, local community, and as well as business came together in a very strong way. So that takes leadership. That takes people on the ground, the community leaders led. And that's what we need from each and every one of us. So keep doing it. Keep doing it. Never, ever give up. And I know some days are hard. I know that. Each and every one of us, we get up, we shake ourselves off, and we make it happen. And you know, that's exactly what Madiba did. You know, if we sit quietly and just think for two seconds how long 27 years was. 27 years. Not minutes. Not months. Years. A long, long time. So if we think about how much he gave up for us and how much we've learned from him. All we need to do is take some of those nuggets out of what he's been able to do, sit quietly and say, what do I do best? What, do, what are my shortfalls? Where can I improve? And you have to make the example. We can't change the world. I can't change the world. You can't change it. None of us on this platform can, but we can lead by example. That's what we can do. We can lead by example and others will naturally follow. But if we don't lead with distinction, how do we expect everybody else to do it? So it starts with us. It starts with me. It starts with me leading with honesty and integrity in what I do. So I have to forward plan better. I have to do preparation work better, which is like even the speaking engagement, for example. What do I need to prepare beforehand? When I'm working with societies, when I'm working in communities, know your audience. And the key takeout is what, it, what I would say is when we get into crisis situations, be calm. Unfortunately, we find that in Africa, we're pretty fiery. And I think South Africans, we're also pretty fiery. And I think the key thing is we've got to learn to position ourselves in the middle of that tornado. Position yourself that you're standing in the middle of this tornado and be calm. And when you can think like an octopus, I always use this analogy, and you can stand calmly in the center of this tornado and look around you at a full 360 and look at all the eventualities in line with your scenario plans, prepare, to the very best of your ability, prepare your messaging, preparing what you're going to say, who you're going to say it to, how you're going to say it, when you're going to say it. It's so important. Then you've done your preparation work. And the other side of it is listen. Often, unfortunately, in crisis situations, there's a lot of talking. A lot of talking and not enough listening. And we need to listen to each other. We knew before the last unfortunate situation that we've just gone through in South Africa, and which has just happened in Tunisia. It happened recently in Haiti. It's happened in France recently, in Italy. And unfortunately, we've seen these, these uprisings more and more because people need to be heard. We need our people to be heard. So let's listen to people, give them their voice, listen and solve the issues quickly. We need to be deliverers. Yes, we can talk. Yes, we can talk with people, 
we can hear people, but please, we also need to be doers. So we're great talkers, but we have to be the doers and the implementers as well. And yes, it does take a lot of work. It does take a lot of rolling up sleeves. It takes a lot of effort, and we have to do that. And sometimes we're going to have to take off the, the fancy outfits and roll up our sleeves, get dirty, cut the fingernails short, and get in there and muck in and just do it. And you know what? The greatest sense of satisfaction is going to come from us being able to look back in five years' time, ten years' time, like in what Rwanda has been able to do as well, and say, well done, well done. Just as we have achieved amazing things in South Africa, as well as amazing things in Africa and currently, and even in Ghana, some phenomenal successes. Let's focus on the successes. We are still focusing too much on the negative instead of looking at the grace and the gift that has been given to us of this incredible Africa. The other side of that is if you're not a spokesperson and you find that if your business or if in an environment there is a crisis situation, choose someone that's around you that's a strong spokesperson. Then please, let's go through media training. Sit the person down, make sure that they've got proper training. Let's make sure that they've got their key messages, they're prepared beforehand, and they're not just thrust into a situation. Make sure that you've got the right, right spokesperson to speak to the right audience at the right time. That's very important. Speak with people in their right language so that there's no break in communication and people are understood in a, in a respectful manner. You know, I've always said if we go into communities that you don't, it's not your first language, get an interpreter. It's okay. It might take longer, but let's get those messages across so that people are respected at all levels of society. We've kind of forgotten a lot of this. Yes, it takes longer. Please respect where we can. And where we don't do that, you'll find that's where we actually are ignored because people want to be respected. All of us want to be respected. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think Madiba, you know, taught us so much the way he walked into a room. He used to walk down those corridors and greet everybody at those functions. And if you all remember, he used to remember, he used to come into the rooms, he used to greet from the, from the porter to the receptionist. To It was beautiful. And many people to this day remember those beautiful moments of shaking his hand. And they never, ever thought they'd shake a president's hand. And that's what it means by don't be above somebody else. Don't think that when you get into fancy positions, you've got fancy titles, you know, you're not above anybody else. We're with society. We are still with society at all levels. So don't differentiate yourself from anybody else. Yes, you might have an important, more important leadership role. And I think that's where we're going to get onto the servant leadership soon. But the key thing is humble yourself to be able to be suitable to be able to be reached out to. If people see you too above other people, remember they won't hear you. And that's a difficult one. I know it's a difficult one because you've worked so hard to get to that position. But when you know that people hear you, it's when people can connect with you and they can understand you at different levels of society. The other one that I really find that I've learned that is that has helped that I've really learned from Madiba over a period of time and that is measure your, your success of your, your, your community communication. So wherever Madiba went, he used to measure, the, to, to get the feedback from the sporting community, from the Afrikaans community, from the Indian community. Ask the communities, what, what did you think about that? Did that, did that land? Did, what did you get, ask people? Don't be afraid of the feedback. And I think that's about don't worry about the failure. You're not always going to be perfect. So listen to the messages, make sure that it's landed that particular audience, go back and redo it, and constantly repeat that. You know, there's an interesting fact that an advert can only be really taken in or absorbed or appreciated after it's seen four times. So the same thing goes with a message. So when I say, for example, today, where I'm mentioning these five tactics of being able to manage situations throughout a crisis, just remember something that not everybody's going to take all five messages in, but I would have to repeat myself four times for it really to land. It's okay. We need to repeat things to a community. We need to repeat things in the market, in a radio interview, TV interview, or when you're speaking to your particular employees, 
remember you need to repeat it at different stages. The other side of it, just in closing, and that is remember something that's very important, is to make sure that you speak on three different platforms. People absorb communication in a crisis particularly on three different platforms. Some people read things exceptionally well, so they, they will read and read and read. Other people will be audible and the other one will be visual. So make sure whenever you're in a crisis, make sure you're reaching those communities with those three levels of different kinds of communication. Speak slowly, speak succinctly, and be humble. Speak with the people. And when people feel your heart, and it's not even too well rehearsed, speak from your heart and your passion. I promise you, you'll get the leadership with you. So just really in closing, and I know we're all going to talk about Madiba a little bit later, but one of the basic, most amazing things that got me through this last month and having been through COVID myself was one thing is don't judge me by my successes. Just judge me by the amount of times that I fell down and I've fallen down many times. I really have. And how many times I've got up. I've had people to inspire me. I've had people to hold my hand through that journey. And I really believe that Madiba still holds us our hand today to rise above all adversity in Africa. So bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Janine. You know, you are quite right. There certainly is something about that handshake from Nelson Mandela. No one has ever been um, shaken by that hand and has ever come out being the same. You know, there's something that fundamentally changed each of us after that handshake. So well done on picking that up because that was quite remarkable about Nelson Mandela. He was really a people's person as you have alluded to. Thank you very much for sharing uh, on what it means to be an authentic leader. And we can also see the passion in yourself when you are speaking about this subject. I call you the queen of authentic leadership. Thank you so much for, for that input. Thank you, Janine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next uh, esteemed speaker is Mr. Busani Ngaweni. Mr. Busani Ngaweni is the Director General and the Principal of the National School of Government. Uh, and he has been uh, in this position since March 2020. Before that, he was the Head of Policy and Research in the Presidency. He was previously the Chief of Staff to the President and the Deputy President Sul Ramaphosa since 2014. He also served as a Chief of Staff to Deputy Presidents Halima Mulante, Malega Mbete, and Punzile Mlambo Unga uh, since 2007. And during his turn, uh, he was part of the Presidency team that oversaw or the strategic national priorities like the national AIDS response through the South African National AIDS Council, uh, preparations for the 2010 FIFA World Cup uh, through the 2010 Interministerial Committee, and also setting up of the national minimum wage through NEDLEC, reforming of visa regulations, the ESCOM uh, war room, public employment programs, and most recently he is the convener of the war room of the, on the national health insurance uh, and he is re-coordinating or uh, he's, he's, he's coordinating rather the re-imagined national industrial strategy and he has written a number of publications of, of which he's an editor and part of the reason why he's here today is that he's also written a book on Nelson Mandela in his capacity as a servant leader. We look forward to hearing your input, DG Busani Ngaweni. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Salela, for that uh, you know, generous introduction. And good afternoon to everyone who is attending here. I do not uh, intend to speak for long because much has been said. I would rather spend more time maybe dealing with questions later on in the, in the, in the conversation. Uh, the danger of asking a public servant to speak on occasions like these, that I could end up uh, giving a keynote, um, giving a keynote, a keynote address. If I was able to share, you know, a, a screen or a presentation, I would have done a gone through a presentation, short presentation. Just if anything, to remind people 
of where we come from, especially for us who work in the public sector uh, today. And it's an important reminder that we in the public service today are like pilots, especially those in senior leadership elected and appointed. We are sitting in the cockpit and this project democracy that we are flying is going through turbulence. As it goes through turbulence, people who are inside this big jumbo jet called Project Democracy are unsure whether we will safely land this or whether we are going to, they will crash and they will all perish. That is the type of anxiety that many people are going through in South Africa today. And in the cockpit, it is those who are in the public service, especially the leadership elected as well as appointed leaders. And I use this metaphor in order to provoke and prick the conscience of those who are in the public service to recall that it is on the basis of our ability to master statecraft an idea that Matiba proposed when he was engaging the Public Service Commission in 1996, that by mastering statecraft, it means we will diligently pilot this aircraft called Project Democracy, working with social partners, of course, and that it must land safely with people knowing full well that they have a future when they actually boarded this aircraft that we are flying called Project Democracy. In many instances, those of you who have flown, when you have had a near miss in a particular aircraft, you will say to yourself, I'm never gonna board that aircraft again or use that airline again because it is unreliable, we nearly died and so on. And this is very important from a point of view of building the credibility and the trust of a particular brand. And this is this instance I'm talking about the public service. To the extent that we can recall on the memory and the lessons of Matiba, to serve South Africans prudently, as he said in 96, when he was addressing the Public Service Commission, people will begin to trust us that the resources that we get as a public sector will be used for the purpose for which they were allocated. Secondly, that we are going to use the positions that we hold and occupy, whether appointed or elected, to advance the interest of the people of South Africa, because it is what he expected of us to do. Deadly, because we are in a very dynamic environment, especially given COVID, you know, and many other pandemics and endemics that are actually afflicting society and the globe today, there is an expectation that we have to be more innovative in a manner in which we are solving the problems of the people of South Africa, and indeed in some instances, the problems of the people of the world. Now, innovation doesn't mean that you turn a public service into a laboratory. As some people reduce innovation into what is done by people wearing white coats in a laboratory. Innovation means thinking outside the box, as we saw Mandela being able to do, where he understood that the resources were limited and he went to the private sector and asked them to make certain contributions as part and parcel of accelerating the pace at which you could deliver facilities such as schools. Given the powers and the positions we occupy in the public sector and the wealth of expertise that resides outside of the public sector, which is possible that we can innovatively tap onto some of those ideas and change the manner in which we are providing services into the people. It is not always that it will cost us millions to innovate. Currently, we know, for example, that SASA, they are under COVID uh, regulation number level five, they had to give 350 rents to people during the COVID period. 
they were able to use the most basic of technologies such as email, WhatsApp and SSD to enroll and over 3 million people successfully enrolled and they got that money without setting foot in a SASA office. Now, if you are privileged, you may think this is just such a silly example. However, for many people who couldn't move around during that period, who, whose livelihood depended on accessing 300 rands, had you asked them to travel, to spend money which they didn't have and file a lot of paperwork, you will have added more pressure on them. And Sasa was able to innovate in the smallest of ways and have over 3 million people being able to apply and access 350 just by using WhatsApp technology. That is innovation at the most basic level and we're able to serve millions of people. And there is many more that we can do. And so in drawing on thinking about how Mandela was able to deal with challenges facing society, whether it was negotiating the constitution or even building a post apartheid state, there was a lot of innovation. In many instances, innovation required that you build compacts with social partners who've got expertise in the higher education sector, in the private sector, as well as in civil society and other international uh, partners. And let me end on this point about building international solidarity. Because when Mandela said South Africa must no longer be the skunk of the world, what he was then saying, this is when he addressed parliament after he was inaugurated at his first speech, what he was actually saying is that South Africa must become part of a solution. And I tell people that when, for the years I spent at the union buildings, you know, four different offices, I used to ask myself, who used to sit in these offices six, in fact, even hundred years ago? There was a meeting in that office where a decision was taken to bomb Mozambique. And one day I was actually sitting in that office thinking about it, and I was with a colleague who was helping to write and a, a, a newspaper uh, was helping to write a press release about South Africa sending you know, soldiers to Mozambique to help in peacekeeping mission. You can see that here is one experience where you change from being a, a skunk where nobody wants you because of the destructive nature of the of your role in the continent to using exactly the same resources, the same infrastructure, to make a contribution positively that will impact in the lives of people in Mozambique who were afflicted by a flood at the time. And so in recalling then the memory of Madiba and his leadership, you know, principles and so on, public servants must always remember that there is no problem that can be solved by someone else other than ourselves because that is why society puts us in the position we are in to solve their problem. And we must do so by being innovative. We must be prudent. We must be professional. And we must be ethical. Otherwise, this aircraft we are flying called Project Democracy will crash land and will put lives of millions of people at risk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Busani Nkaweni. Very well said. So we'll be moving over to the next session of the program and to in March. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Busani Nkaweni. So he's been speaking on servant leadership and of course the modalities and style for servant leadership modeling from Nelson Mandela. Our very third speaker is Mr. Ashraf Gadaf. Ashraf Gadaf would lead this virtual conversation on champion leadership. A brief into Mr. Ashraf Gadaf's profile. He's the founding member of Champion South Africa and he's a global moderator, champion thinking speaker. He's a media trainer and communications consultant. Mr. Gadaf recently concluded a long stint with the South African Broadcasting Corporation. He was best known as a talk show host on SAFM, that's South African FM and the radio station. He's also the host of investigative television show, Special Assignment. In November, 2020, Ashraf Gadaf was appointed as a member of the Council of Champions of the Social Justice M Plan, the brainchild of Professor Thuli Madonsela. He has served as program directors on many high impact events, 
including the BRICS Summit Business Forum attended by the presidents of both South Africa and China, including India. He's also served as Programs Director on the Solidarity Fund Media Briefing. He's also served as Program Director for the launch of the International Expert Gathering in Dubai. Productivity South Africa Awards had him as the Project Director, amongst others. Participating actively, I'd like to invite each and every one of you to use the chat box where you can agree with each and every one of the speakers and as well disagree with the speakers on where you think the points don't necessarily fit your perspective. So I look forward to engaging each and every one of you on the chat box to further this conversation. Very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm more than pleased to welcome Mr. Ashraf Godaf to give us his presentation on champion leadership. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you indeed. And, and certainly a a privilege for me to be a part of this, this esteemed gathering, uh, but also, I mean, to pick up from uh, following what has been discussed before. We've had what authentic leadership, then we've had servant leadership, and now you know champion leadership. And I'm trying to think in some way or the other, they all are absolutely interlinked on that. But I'm going to start as we talk about you know Madiba's champion leadership, and, and it's we could spend two hours talking about that. But but let me try and do that in as short a time as possible, Ron. And I want to go back to that the Chris Harney uh, incident. Now, he was a member of the African National Congress and the South African Communist Party, and at that time said to be the, the second most popular person within that organization um, after, after Nelson Mandela. And he was assassinated on the 10th of April 1993. And we then knew that only after that, that a year, a year later, we would have our first ever democratic election. But when that happened, when he was assassinated, this highly esteemed figure within the, the revolutionary forces of our country, um, the country exploded. People were, were angry. People went out in the streets and they burnt and they looted, but it was, a, it was an expression of immense anger and disillusionment, a sense of like, how can they kill Chris Hani? And there was a sense at that stage that South Africa's negotiation to a to reconciling a democratic project was going to be in tatters. And need I say it, civil war was looming. That was a year before we went to election. At that time, one man stepped up and, and he addressed the nation. And Pumla Williams said a few things about that man. And I want to just say a bit more because I think that gives us the essence of champion leadership. He said, tonight I'm reaching out to every single South African, black and white, from the very depths of my being. I mean, just, just look at the choice of words he's used, okay? And then he said, a white man full of prejudice and hate came to our country and committed a deed so foul and our whole nation now teeters on the brink of disaster. And then he said a white woman of Africana origin risked her life so that we may know and bring justice to this assassin. Again, the choice of words. And then he said, now is the time for all South Africans to stand together against those whom from any quarter wish to destroy what Chris Hani gave his life for, for freedom of all of us. And he continued, now is the time for our white compatriots from whom messages of condolence continue to pour in to reach out with an understanding of the grievous loss to our nation to join in the memorial services and the funeral commemorations. And he continued, and I'm going to just get to the end. He said, this is a watershed moment for all of us. Our decisions and actions will determine whether we use our pain, our grief, and our outrage to move forward to what is the only lasting solution for our country, an elected government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And he finally said, we must not let the men who worship war and who lust after blood precipitate actions that will plunge our country into another Angola. And that man, as you can gather, is Nelson Mandela. That day, he was presidential. 
And yet he wasn't even the president. He wasn't even in parliament. At that time, he could not even vote. But that, that day, Nelson Mandela spoke as the leader of our country. And that is a good example of champion leadership. I think it's particularly important to reflect on when we, when we talk of champion, what is it? It's a noun. It talks about the best in class, but it's a verb as well. It talks about championing a cause, right? And champion leaders do both. They are nouns and verbs. They are the cause. They pick up the cause and they become champions because they follow the cause. And often enough, they're champions already and therefore they pick up the cause. But champion leaders ultimately are able to do both. And I have no doubt that Nelson Mandela did both. Because I, I also reflect, and I, I think these lessons are so important. I reflect back to the day he was released and he spoke at the Grand Parade in Cape Town. And really, you know, we tend to forget just how powerful his statements were. Like, we can't just ignore this, really. Even at a time when we now look out for more and more important leaders in our country, he said, I stand before you not as a prophet, you remember that? But as a humble servant of you, the people. Your tireless and heroic sacrifices have made it possible for me to be here today. I, will, I therefore place the remaining years of my life, what did he say? In your, in your hands. And I also think back on that same day, I mean, that's another example. Even when they were journeying from Victor Festier prison to the Grand Parade, in his autobiography, he talks about it, that as they were driving to the countryside uh, from like nearby Paul uh, to Cape Town, there was, he saw people on the roads. And, and can you believe it? This prisoner steps out of a car and greets this family. And he made the point that it's a white family because they, they, they sort of had their hands aloft first suggesting that they, they agreed with, with his own position. He went and up to them and he thanked them. And we may think that's trivial, but then he also wore the Springbok jersey of the captain of the time in 1995, just a year after South Africa became a democratic nation. And, and he wore the jersey of Francois Pinard, the number six, hugely, hugely symbolical. And for those of us who may think, ah, that's just nonsense talk, Think about this, because I love this quote from The Art of War, right? And it talks about, to win without fighting is best. That is the essence of Nelson Mandela, isn't it? To win without fighting is best. Because you know, we made reference to Rwanda early on, Janine spoke about it. In that same period, Rwanda went into this bloody civil war. Bos Yugoslavia was torn apart. But what did Madiba and his colleagues do? To win without fighting is best. That's the type of champion leadership we need. Which brings me to think about what is, what about champion leaders in a crisis? I mean, and that's the topic of conversation today, isn't it? Now, in the current scenario, our president talks about an insurrection, uh, an overthrow of the state, a, an attack on the democratic system of South Africa. We know what we've experienced. We've had mass looting, we've had destruction, we've had extremity, we've had accusations of racial profiling um, in, in KZN, in Phoenix. We don't really know what actually happened, but we do know there's been destruction. And I can only think if I look at the example of, of Nelson Mandela, what he would be doing today, he would be very much in the hotbed because he had this unique ability of making an emotional connection and somehow even and we can't deny that even in the last two weeks the country has been a bit more divided than we've been together although there's been subsequent attempts to bring us together but Madiba had this ability even in the time of crisis he had this ability to speak for all and that for me is champion leadership not to be taken idly we know I mean, he had another crisis, the Ravonia trial, when, when his entire leadership of his organization was facing possible death. And you know, he spoke about his ideals and representing everybody, of course, and saying it's an ideal that if needs be, I'm willing to die for, right? 
So that is responding in a time of crisis. Now, why is all that important? Because it's a challenge to you and I today. What we experienced two weeks ago in South Africa is a crisis. How we respond to that is up to us. But in all situations, the best way to respond is look at what champions do. And look at the examples of Nelson Mandela, not just him, but he's the classic example and he's made in South Africa. Okay, so look at what champions do. He was inclusive. He always was inclusive, inclusive of ethnicity, inclusive of polit even party politics. He was able to transcend that. Um, he saw obstacles as stepping stones. But he was also firm, a man of principle. I mean, his historical record with allies and human rights, like the Palestinian issue, he's been upfront about it. So those who think Mandela was all fun and games and wanted to be everybody's friend, go back to his track record and you will see a formidable opponent because he was firm on the issue of human rights. He absolutely was, right? You know he was at the leadership front when they picked up the armed struggle at a time when we know that things were just not going to work out any longer. And there were no democratic options for the majority of the people of this country. So he was conciliatory, but he also reconciled himself to the fact that at some time you need to play hardball. And I think he did that. He played hardball. So what about you and I? As we talk now about the rebuild of South Africa and by extension, maybe the rebuild of Africa and so many other parts of the world, but let's stay with South Africa. You know, it's not totally lost on us that we have some serious problems in our country. And whatever caused the incitement of the people, one thing is obvious. There are just far too many people that are struggling on the extremes of society, from extreme wealth to extreme poverty. And that cannot be. And for those of you who may suggest to say, but that is Madiba's problem. You see, if he didn't negotiate the way he did, we had all been fine. No, his job was to secure the peace. His job was to give us democracy. His job was to ensure there was nation building, there was statehood, there was a coming together of, of all the people. It was the job of the, those who followed him, including you and me, to try and create the economic miracles that this country needs and now so desperately needs. So it's no sense looking back. Madiba played his role. And I think he played his role to perfection. Well, maybe perfection is a strong word because, of course, he had flaws. But by and large, on a game plan of a sports team, he played the winning game. It's up to us now to pick up the ball and run or pick up the baton and move on. So as we move on to rebuild South Africa specifically, and we look at how we can be inspired on this issue of leading or leadership in a crisis, we have to look at, I've mentioned the issue of, of wealth. I've mentioned the issue, well, I do believe this. If you look at one of the big problems with South Africa, our townships look like townships or locations, as it's been called in a negative form all those years ago. They still look like townships and locations. And our suburbs look like suburbs. And until our suburbs start, or rather, until our townships begin looking like suburbs, we would have known that our efforts to try and create a united economic South Africa has not quite worked. So my point to you, therefore, is what are we going to learn from some of the aspects of Madiba? He's done so many more. I can't touch on all of that. But what he's done has been champion-like, no question about it. And I use the example of why are there no skyscrapers in townships? Something. So let me go back to what I know best, Champion South Africa, the project that I head up. And we have an ideal to build South Africa into a champion nation. Now we believe, and I believe, champion people build champion communities. Well, champion people build champion families, champion people build champion communities, champion people build champion businesses, 
champion people, bold champion organizations, champion people, bold champion nations. But ultimately, as a beginning starting point, champion people, bold champion people. And if you reflect on the history of Nelson Mandela and his life work and his decisions he's made and the incredible body of quotations, which are remarkable, then here's a good example of a person who's the embodiment of champion people, bold champion people. And therefore, for me, when it comes to me talking about champion leadership, I'm very comfortable endorsing the fact that Nelson Mandela is number one in that group of people, of champion people, who bold champion people. Because at the end, what is Nelson Mandela? We all have our own examples. Many of us have the privilege of meeting him. Others have also met him, if not physically, then they've met him by his books and by following his stories. At his very essence, Nelson Mandela embodied champion leadership because Nelson Mandela made the impossible possible. I thank you. Ten reasons why you should invest in South Africa. Number one, hot emerging market. Number two, the number one diversified economy in Africa. Number three, the largest presence of multinationals on the African continent. Number four, progressive constitution and independent judiciary. Number five, favorable market access to global markets. Number six, abundant natural resources. Number seven, advanced financial services and banking sector. Number eight, world-class infrastructure and logistics. Number nine, young trainable labor force. And number 10, excellent quality of life. Is Pamela there? Ah, there's Pamela. Mr. Kingsley, okay, can we just, let's unmute you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, it's been an amazing um, session. I am guaranteed that everyone on this session has um, has gotten so much information. Uh, like, um, uh, you know, um, some of the speakers had spoken that if we were to, you know, um, um, depend on this or, or rest on this program, we'll probably be spending the rest of the day discussing uh, the great Madiba's leadership lessons. But um, we may not be able to take all the questions, but I can assure you that if you have more questions, uh, you can use uh, some of the platforms to drop them and would, uh, as, as much as possible, try to respond uh, independently afterwards. We'll pass on your questions to the appropriate authorities. But um, very quickly, each one of us here would um, give us their 
memorable quotes from the great Madiba. I understand that we have a treasure trove of information, but we're going to just take one from each member, uh, each of the speakers and everyone who has spoken today so that we can remind ourselves of these lessons. And as we go, we can hold on to these lessons and continue to remind ourselves that we must live by this, uh, this quotes. And I'll just uh, go from, um, 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 let me just in no particular order, I would go from what I see on my screen. And uh, let, me, let me go first by uh, Janine. Janine, would you be kind enough to give us your leadership quotes? Yeah, I think something that's been very relevant to me in the last couple of weeks, and that has been courage. You know, courage is not the absence of fear. I think none of us live with that. You know, it's not the absence of fear. It's the inspiration of others to move beyond that. I think that's one of the great sayings of Madiba. So thank you so much. Okay, I think, thank you very much. Courage from Jennings. And I'd like to take, of course, a quote from um, Ashraf, my very good friend. Uh, what is your own, uh, what's your most favorable or memorable quote of the great Madiba? Well, the reality, Kingsley, is I probably could give you 10 quotes um, and, and they're all relevant. It's almost like such a terrible thing to tell us to say, give me one, when, when the truth is we can give you so many, right? And I suggest people that you, people must, I mean, I'd love the, the audience to say, hey, this is my favorite quote, and they can't do it even on the webinar. They need to tweet all of us and, and, and share that, because I'd like to think, what is your favorite Mandela quote or Madiba quote? But yeah. this is not necessarily my favorite, but I think it's 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 the most important in the context of of what i had to speak about today which is champion leadership and and this is what he said he said what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived it is what difference we have made to the lives of others and that will determine the significance of i i life. totally agree of the life yeah. we lead. So, I mean, hopefully you've got that. It's the, the difference we make to others. And, and that for me is the very essence of, of authentic leadership, uh, servant leadership, and absolutely champion leadership. And really, I'm not gonna emphasize, I, I can't overemphasize this, but it's that important. Do we <laughs> as South Africans, and do we as Africans, do we fully understand mm -hmm. that we've had Madiba in our midst? And do we value that? Or did he expect him to solve every single problem of ours in our country and our continent when he himself said, I'm not a prophet? Think about that because the onus now is on us to pick up that quote and can we embody that in our lives? Amazing. I, I totally agree, Ashraf. Uh, ten or more. Uh, there's so much from the treasure trove of the great Madiba. Uh, but because we're pressed for time, uh, thank you for that amazing, amazing, uh, uh, that amazing quote. And I'll just like to take uh, the quote from uh, Mr. Busani. If you're ready, can you just give us one of your memorable quotes? I understand you have so much, but one will just suffice for this particular event. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I mean, the one is the one that uh, I was referring to, which is a speech she was giving to the Public okay. Service Commission in 1996. Uh, well, where if it's not ready at the moment, I think we can take from uh, Wofai. Wofai, are you on? Can you give us one of your most memorable quotes of the great Madiba? Can you hear me? Kingsley, can you hear me? Uh, are you able to hear me, Pumela? Yes, please go ahead, DJ uh, Naweni, okay. and, and share right. the quote with us. Thank you. Uh, okay. No, thank you. It's basically just to paraphrase, he was speaking in 1996 to the you know, Public mm -hmm. Service Commission. One of the most important speeches he gave to public servants that for the majority of South Africans, the public service was seen as a hostile instrument of an oppressive minority. And he said, mm -hmm. we must transform it. And then he closed it by saying, no doubt this task will produce much more testing times. And given where we are now with COVID-19 and so on, these are those testing times. And by going back to draw on his wisdom of that time, we should get an inspiration, therefore, on how we must deal with the testing times ahead of us. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. 
And um, I wouldn't be surprised that that one also became your favorite as you are the principal of the National School of Government in South Africa and public service is very close to your heart. Thank you, DJ Naweni. Over to you, Kingsley. network glitch and um, i'm sorry about that please accept my apologies uh, um for me i think the the greatest um, or one of the greatest quotes like uh, uh, ashraf would put it and not of course there's so much to 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 talk about but because of my personal belief uh of about um leading from behind uh, there's a there's a great quote from from the great medieval who says that lead from the back and let others believe they are in front it means that uh, oftentimes when people take absolute control of, um, of, 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 of leadership, as it were, when you democratize leadership and allow people to take control, you find that you, 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 in, you inherently have built in them the confidence to take their own destinies into their own hands. At a time like this, I believe that what we all need to do is to make our people understand that leadership is not positional. Leadership is not about uh, who is who is uh, occupying the office of a minister, a governor, or a president, or whatever. We are all leaders in our right. So if we are able to lead, you know, in our own individual spaces collectively, we would of course make the difference that we desire as a people, as a nation in South Africa, as a continent, of course, uh, 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 as as a continent and as a people. And I believe that going forward. This should be the central message for leaders across the continent. Let's lead from behind and let the people believe they're in front. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wafai, what is your memorable quote? Um, you are muted, unfortunately. I sincerely apologize for that. So my best and favorite memorable quotes of the late global icon Nelson Mandela is, anyone and everyone can achieve success if they're putting a lot of hard work and commitment over time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Lonwago Chabavu as well, who's shared there that leadership is not positional. I must say that in the context of what we've gone through, um, I reflected a lot on which of the Madiba codes that would speak to the current situation. I, I must say myself, I have a lot of uh, favorite Nelson Mandela codes, but here's one that I will share with you. He said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or religion. People must learn to hate, and if they learn to hate, they can be taught love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Uh, thank you to those uh, participants who are also sharing their favorite um, Madiba quotes. Thank you, uh, Ashraf, for making that clarion call for the participants to share. See, Dili Dube, uh, she says, a winner is a dreamer who never gives up. Thank you for that. Uh, Dili Dube is actually um, uh, in the United Kingdom, and she's been nominated for five awards in the upcoming Mzansi Jazz Awards, and she will be traveling from the UK to South Africa for such an occasion. Thank you for joining us today. Balebong uh, says, action without vision is only passing time, and vision without action is merely daydreaming. Wow, can we get our team to capture all of these because they really, really are quite inspirational. Thank you for everyone who's sharing their quotes. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, to close this up. Oh, okay. Briannette Lebovitz, he says, courage is not the absence of fear. 
Well, we're getting a lot of participation. Thank you so much to each of you who is participating today. You can just see the enthusiasm amongst the participants. And I really, really, really trust that you are coming out as reinvigorated as I am from the discussions that I held here today, more so for each of us to play our part in making this world a better place. Let me tell you, no deed is too small and no person is insignificant to be the change that they want to see. So today we've seen, ladies and gentlemen, that the recurring theme is that of honoring Mandela, who would have thrived in this conversation because he felt that, let me quote him, he said, good leaders fully appreciate that the removal of tensions in society puts creative thinkers on center stage by creating an ideal environment for men and women of vision to influence society. We have heard today men and women of vision sharing from different perspectives, authentic leadership, Janine, champion leadership, Ashraf Garda, servant leadership, DG Busani Ngaweni, and the overall message from the DG of GCIS, DG Ms. Pumla Williams. And by his own admission, ladies and gentlemen, Nelson Mandela made mistakes, uh, both political and personal. However, his human flaws and his weaknesses did not deter him from the bigger goal. He referred to himself as a winner, as a sinner who keeps trying. He said that he is a sinner who keeps trying. And the Nelson Mandela Foundation has published a book uh, which mentions the disciplines and the principles um, of Nelson Mandela's leadership. They highlight these as listening. Uh, he spent more time listening uh, than talking. It is humanity. He believed in the fundamental goodness of human beings. Pain. The way he saw pain is that he chose to see pain, not as, as pain, but as painful. So he saw it as something that you could learn from. And he also took responsibility. He took responsibility for failure, knowing that failure is unavoidable. Um, he, he, his principle was liberating oneself. Because, and he believed that you have to liberate yourself before you liberate a country. He also had humor. In his later life, Nelson Mandela was really renowned for his warmth and his humor. And he came to know and to learn how to laugh at himself. And recording was one of his principles. Mandela loved to write. And, and he wanted to write notes on paper, you know, hard, hard paper. And he was an obsessive uh, creator of records. He also respected time and taking care of body and soul. He led a healthy lifestyle. Even in prison, he used to exercise every single day. He also had a unique ability to befriend mortality. He demonstrated that a lifetime of befriending death is always part of life. And what we saw is that Nelson Mandela as a leader had an extraordinary sense of timing. I think Kingsley Okeke referred to this. Nelson Mandela seemed to have an instinct for knowing when he should leave, when he should lead from behind, being the shepherd behind his flock, and when he should lead from uh, the front. He had a fine instinct of knowing when to give ground and when to take it and when to wait and when to move. And so these are disciplines that anyone can learn and everyone can use them to help finding the leader within themselves. I would like to thank Selo Hatang, the CEO of Nelson Mandela Foundation, and Verne Harris, who was Nelson Mandela's archivist from 2004 to 2013. And he, Verne is also with the Nelson Mandela Foundation. They both co-authored the book called I Know This To Be True about Nelson Mandela. And they shared this book with me generously. And how I personally got to know Mr. Nelson Mandela is through education. Nelson Mandela believed that um, education liberates, and he promoted access to it at every turn and in every possible way. He personally gave me a scholarship to study in the United Kingdom. 
when he gave me the scholarship, he said, you are my ambassador. You carry my name. And for that, I will forever be grateful. He believed so much in education that he said, education is a great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become the head of a mine, that the child of a farm worker can become the president of a great nation. It is what we make out of what we have, um, not what we are given, that separates one person from another. Thank you to the DG of GCIS, Ms. Pumla Williams, for her keynote address. Thank you, Mr. Kingsley Okeke, the managing editor at Africa Leadership Magazine. Thank you to our moderator, Ms. Wofai Samuel, who is the director at the UK Liberia Chamber of Commerce. Our esteemed guest, DJ Busani Ngaweni, who is the principal of South Africa's National School of Government, the CEO of Janine Hills Authentic Leadership, Miss Janine Hills, whom I call the Queen of Authentic Leadership, and the visionary behind the movement, Champion South Africa, Mr. Ashraf Garda, who is the founding champion of this organization. This webinar would never have taken place without the participation of each and every one of you who is our audience today. Thank you so much for the gift of your time. Thank you for joining us on Zoom and YouTube and Facebook. And please, after this, share the, you know, the webinar uh, amongst your friends. This message that was shared today really needs to reach far and wide. Thank you for your participation in the discussions as well. And we hope that you have taken something from Nelson Mandela and the examples that have been shared today in order to fulfill the leader inside you. Mandela himself said, the world is full of people with natural leadership qualities. And so with this, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Brand South Africa, I myself as a UK country head for Brand South Africa, and on behalf of the African Leadership um, Limited United Kingdom, thank you for joining us. Have a good day, Fena. Thank you so much. Do you know what it really means to be brave? I can tell you, it takes heart and a people who after failing once, twice, many times to stop, get up and try again. It takes a leader who says, we will rise from the ashes and try again. Who put his people, their freedom and the country's democracy first? What does it mean to be brave? It means being open to opportunities and overcoming the fear of exposure. It's brave to focus on more than just the tangible. Bravery, it's not about shouting loudly and making bold moves. It's about continuity. To prove time and again that we have what it takes, that we're a force to be reckoned with. But it's not enough to only acknowledge our faults. We have to be brave enough to intentionally address them. This is the year in which we will turn the tide on corruption. Because it takes bravery to keep going, to keep growing. It takes bravery to take a stand in the midst of a revolution. To take a leap of faith in a climate of opportunity. And stand at the ready for what the future might bring. To welcome those who push the boundaries. And being open to the unknown. Because it takes bravery to realize potential. What I'm trying to say is that it's bravery that makes all the difference. Invest in South Africa, the brave future.